Hello again, everyone. Welcome back. This is panel C, intersections of the New England Graphic Medicine uh, Virtual Summit. I am your co-host and organizer, A. David Lewis. Comfortable in my recliner, because one of the upsides of a virtual conference is that uh, when your back is feeling ouchy, you can go sit somewhere comfy to do these. So if I look at all slouched, I'm, I'm very, very sorry. We have some great panelists today, and I'm going to be uh, working. Ah, our, our last panelist has joined us. Uh, Karen Rohr is here, and I will be working with her to get her presentation ready. Uh, no one need worry. Karen, we see you. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, but I believe we're going to start with uh, Natalie Wardlaw and Izzy Manley from the Center for Cartoon Studies in Vermont. Uh, I am going to disappear, and I believe Phoebe is going to temporarily disappear. We will be back. Um, one last uh, bit of housekeeping. We do have a second session going on right now. Uh, so... While I welcome you to hear these panelists, I think they have some excellent and valid things to say. We will not be offended if you switch between the two or have the two going concurrently. <laughs> Lastly, if you want to discuss this on social media, please use has hashtag NEGM20. You've probably heard me repeat this any number of times, but NEGM20 uh, is the way that we can remain in touch. So. Izzy, Natalie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I am just going to go ahead and pull up our slides. Um, Natalie, can you confirm that you can hear me okay? Yes, I hear you and I see our slides. Perfect. Um, so uh, we're going to jump right in. Thank you all so much for tuning in. And thank you so much to everyone who's participated and also to everyone who's made this wonderful conference possible. We're just so excited to participate. Um, our talk is called Witness Trauma and Process. Artists from the Center for Cartoon Studies reflect on narrative and practice. My name is Izzy Manley. And I'm Natalie Wardlaw. Um, and we're both second year students at the Center for Cartoon Studies. Natalie is gonna tell us a little bit more about our school. So the Center for Cartoon Studies was founded in 2005 and is a two year MFA program that also offers one and two year certificates. The first year is the foundational year where students learn cartooning basics as well as production skills to digitize art and bring it to full printed mini comic completion. CCS places a large emphasis on printed comics, requiring almost every assignment to be printed and bound. The CCS lab is equipped with everything you will need to provide highly polished mini comics and books, uh, including a screen printing studio. The Schultz Library is an exceptional resource for the school. It is home to over 20,000 books, including graphic novels, reference material, and art books and over 4,000 mini comics and zines. It is one of the largest collections of comics in the United States and continues to grow every year. The library is open to the general public, but borrowing privileges are restricted to CCS students and faculty. So I'm gonna start our talk with this wonderful comic from Whit Taylor. Definitely go back and reread it. Um, I'm so grateful she gave us permission to share it. And I just wanted to contextualize the kind of comics Natalie and I are gonna talk about. Uh, Taylor um, is identifying some subfields within graphic medicine that exist to provide education, instruction, education about the history of medicine, uh, journalism, advocacy for public health, and graphic medicine also exists as a form of self-expression and connection. Taylor says writing about our personal experiences can help us process and connect with others. We can expand our awareness, fight stigma, and build empathy. And so this is really the subfield and kind of work that Natalie and I are gonna be talking about today. Um, and I just quickly wanted to talk about our perspectives on patient-created graphic narratives. Um, we're not doctors, health professionals, public health experts. Uh, 
you know, front desk workers in a doctor's office. Um, those perspectives are all so important and it's been wonderful to hear from them in this conference. Um, we're coming to this as artists, patients, students, comics readers and scholars. So there might be, um, you know, specific medical knowledge or perspectives that we lack. Um, and I just wanted to be really clear about um, the perspective that we are bringing that I think can be really interesting as well. Um, and Natalie and I are gonna kind of talk about some different things, but we're basically asking the same question, which is what benefit do patient artists derive from the process of creating a graphic narrative? Oh, my presentation is called Trauma Narratives, Putting the Graphic in Graphic Memoir, and I'll be presenting after Izzy. And my presentation, oh, uh, it looks like somebody else just pulled up their slide. So I'm going to go ahead and open ours back up. Yes, Perfect. I'm pleased to say that Karen, Karen Rohrer has joined us. Her Hi, Karen. Are successfully <laughs> uploaded and prepared, but we'll let uh, the two of you proceed. Sorry for the interruption. Oh, perfect. Glad that everyone's here. Um, so my presentation, I'm going to dive right in now, is called Patient Created Graphic Narratives as Alternative Me Medical Record. Wanted to give a really quick side note. Um, I do want to apologize for some of the lower res images in this presentation, and also the fact that many of my examples lean heavily on the canon that Matthew so insightfully discussed in an earlier panel. Um, given the restrictions we're all facing, I was just a little limited in what text I could access online. But I do think a lot of this discussion can apply to those less canonical and self-published works. Um, also, just a quick heads up, there are a few explicit drawn images of bodies. I'm going to click through them very quickly, but just a little warning if you are watching with younger guests. So, my medical records are documentation of all the treatment tests and prescriptions I have received as a patient, as well as other notes my doctors made about me. And each medical professional I see keeps their own records. So if I've seen a lot of different doctors, the story of my treatment in those records is literally fragmented, split between different filing cabinets or different patient databases. Um, and as a patient rather than a professional, some of the information in my record can be really hard for me to understand or decode. Um, here I've juxtaposed some records of urine cultures taken when I had a UTI, and here's a drawn image from a comic of me experiencing that UTI, and alone separated, um, these pictures both provide incomplete information about a patient experience. Um, so as a personal narrative of health, medical records are thus often insufficient fragmented, incomplete, and they don't include the patient's subjective emotional experience of a treatment or information about their life outside a hospital or doctor's office. In this talk, I'm going to posit the patient-created graphic narrative as an alternative medical record, the patient artist's attempt to create a comprehensive, holistic story of illness and treatment. Um, so though I'm going to talk about work by other creators and comics theorists, I'm going to start with a little anecdote about my own artistic process for this comic, Vestibule. This is a comic I started last spring, and it's about several years I spent seeking treatment for and living with vestibulitis, um, which is a localized form of vulvodynia, a stinging and burning pain that some people experience in their vagina during sex and other daily activities. So when I started this comic, I thought I was going to write something really literary and poetic. I thought it was cool that vestibule was also an architectural term for a waiting room, an entrance chamber. Um, and I thought I was really just going to focus on the emotional aspect of this condition. But when I started writing, I um, ended up writing a narrative that was really linear. It was very chronological and complete. I was going back through my old emails and schedules, trying to figure out when I'd seen a specific doctor and then drawing interactions that had happened in those appointments and dating them. I wasn't at home, so I asked my boyfriend to send me photographs of old prescriptions and pills because it felt really important to me to draw these things as accurately and realistically as possible. And I asked myself, why was I so focused on putting so much factual detail into a personal story? 
Why would anyone reading this really care about when I saw a specific doctor or what brand of drug I was prescribed and what the label looked like? So when you're treating a chronic illness, it can be really exhausting to explain to your friends and family every appointment, every new prescription that doesn't work. The pain I experienced was invisible and vaginal pain is also taboo. So when I was going through pain, I couldn't always express why in public. And during the several years covered in the comic, I had four different kinds of insurance, employer-based, ACA, Medicaid, and the type of insurance and my financial situation at the time really impacted what kind of care and treatment I could access. And I was often at the center of difficult miscommunications between my doctor, my pharmacist, and my insurance company. So I realized I was making my comic because I wanted a record of my own experience a story I could show my friends, partner, and even maybe my future doctors to explain specifically and in detail what my record of living with and fighting treatment for vestibulitis was like. And I also recognized this same impulse to create a record or document of treatment in work by other cartoonists. When I think about patient-created graphic narratives, the most common visual trope I see over and over is medical ephemera, charts, prescriptions, x-rays, forms. And I think there's a reason that artists return to this imagery of the medical document over and over again. In Disaster Drawn, the comics theorist Hilary Chute describes comics as visual verbal narrative documentary. In this book, Chute is primarily interested in comics that tell personal stories of historical traumas. But her exploration of the documentary in war comics can also apply to graphic medicine. Chute distinguishes between official and human documents. So things like prescriptions and medical records would be official documents, and the patient's diary or their drawn experience would be human documents. Um, so this trend is exemplified in these panels from Chronic, a comic by my co-presenter, Natalie. Um, in these drawings, Natalie's redrawing labels from her prescription bottles and binders she's compiled of her medical records, really emphasizing realism and detail. In Cancer Vixen, a memoir of breast cancer by Marisa Akachella, uh, the artist is collaging her own surgical pathology reports under comic panels, emphasizing the material factual reality of the story literally underneath her own subjective drawn experience of it. In Rx, Rachel Lindsay's graphic memoir about her mental health crisis, she uses the device of the doctor's clipboard as a frame. So the narration here is in third person and it's in the formal tone of a doctor, but the comics on the clipboard actually represent Lindsay's own perspective while she was institutionalized. She's superimposing her own experience over the formal and clinical notes taken by her doctor. And in Marbles, subtitled Mania Depression, Michelangelo Me, Ellen Forney is hand lettering text from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, superimposing bubbles her, that show her own reactions whilst reading over this text. She collages drawings and diaries she made during periods of mania and depression into her graphic memoir. Um, and so this is an example of a story that's actually combining official documents like the DSM alongside the artist's own personal or human documentation of her lived experience. Hilary Chute asserts that through Marx, comics is a form able to combine official and human documents. And we see this in work heavily driven by reconstituting archives. In patient creative graphic narratives, by redrawing and like reinscribing these official medical records, patients are able to combine the confidential clinical record from their doctor with a lived story of their own experience by actually drawing them in the same hand. Chute states, marks made on paper by hand are an index of the body in a way a photograph taken through a lens is not. Traces of a human hand are very evident when a cartoonist tries to redraw an official document in the deeply personal physical quality of their line, in their handwriting. The mark they make on paper is literally self-referential and a way the patient can reclaim a kind of authorship over their medical experience. 
So in constructing an alternative medical record, patient artists are asking their readers to bear witness to medical experiences, which are usually private and unseen. Many cartoonists are emphasizing spatial aspects like closed doors in a therapist's office or a hospital curtain around a bed as a visual reminder that moments once screened or obstructed from view are being revealed in a comic. These examples, again, are from Marbles and Cancer Vixen. Witnessing as a concept applied to narrative is often closely associated with trauma. The narrative reconstructs an experience which may be remembered in fragments or may not be remembered at all due to its traumatic nature. And the reader is asked to bear witness to this experience in their reception of the narrative. In her pregnancy memoir, Kid Gloves, Lucy Nisley draws a sequence in the birth story chapter in which she experiences an emergency C-section then a seizure from the point of view of her husband. She begins this section with the title, the following portion is written from John's perspective and in smaller letters, because I do not remember it. By redrawing um, this sequence from another person's testimony, Nisley is able to reconstruct this traumatic part of her birthing story in her own hand within the longer narrative of her pregnancy, rendering the larger framing story more complete and comprehensive. However, the change in style in the sequence from a full color to a more monochromatic blue line emphasizes the unknown aspect of the story, which is literally rendered more sparsely and full of stark blank space. And that's a marked contrast from her usual bright full color style, which only starts to return to the comic as she draws the panels where she regains consciousness. However, although the concept of witness is often evoked in reference to narratives of trauma, Hilary Chute argues that na within narrative and stories, trauma is not necessarily a precondition of witnessing. She's talking about uh, comics of shocking and devastating wartime events like Mouse and Joe Sacco's footnotes in Gaza, and Chute asserts, while these works are driven by such traumatic events, these events are not isolated. Their works also bear witness through words and images to the everyday, to the ordinary, and to the scenes of enunciation that produce the acts of witness. These are works in which the object of witness operate on scales both large and small. Motivated by crisis, they bear witness to lived experience that is often shaped by crisis, but is not fully dictated by it. So I would argue that witness plays a really similar role in graphic medical memoir. And while many comics in the genre do reference mental or bodily experiences that can be personally very traumatic, cartoonists are also asking their readers to bear witness in the act of reading a visual text to a range of unseen but not necessarily traumatic activities. For example, the everyday reality of living with chronic illness and the side effects of medication. Here are some examples, again, from chronic and vestibule. Or images that are socially taboo, maybe explicit or intimate images of the body, private moments of distress. So in the Graphic Medicine Manifesto, Ian Williams states, what is captivating about the best graphic pathographies is they contain precisely the information left out of or never considered for inclusion in textbooks. But they go further depicting emotion and feeling, tackling the taboo or the liminal. In this wonderful essay from the Graphic Medicine Manifesto, Comics in the Iconography of Illness, Williams also states, graphic memoirs of illness stem precisely from the need to express oneself and possibly to challenge the medical authority from which the author feels excluded. Many patient-made graphic narrative emphasize points of disagreement or dismissal by medical professionals, and the artists are asking their re reader to bear witness to these interactions, not to call out a specific doctor or shame anyone, but as a larger project of bearing witness to parts of the system that are dysfunctional, in which medical providers are overstretched and overburdened, and power dynamics and profit motives are operating within the space. In this example from Kid Gloves, Lucy Nisley asks readers to bear witness to the way her concerns about a clampsia are brushed off, the cloud of foreboding boot doom above her head as she, liter as she worries is literal foreshadowing for later chapters in which Nisley will depict her near fatal eclampsia during birth. 
In Rx, Lindsay emphasizes the lack of agency she feels as a patient, given little choice over how to manage her mental health. She and her psychiatrist are shown in silhouette as she's handed a prescription. Her individuality in this image is literally obscured and overshadowed. Um, the last aspect of the record I want to talk about is bills. While your billing records are often kept separate from your medical records, they may be processed by another part of the hospital or in the faraway office of an insurance company, many cartoonists explicitly incorporate reference to the cost of their treatment and their insurance status into their graphic medical memoirs. And by explicitly addressing this aspect of healthcare, especially in the United States, the cartoonist's alternative medical record gives a more complete picture of health and illness from the personal to the systemic. In Cancer Vixen, Akachella invites readers into another enclosed private space, but this time is the cubicles in the hospital's billing department, where uninsured patients like her must fill out endless forms and pay large sums of money before they can access treatment. In Marbles, Ellen Forney includes a page titled, Ironically, This Is Not a Disease for an Artist's Budget, in which she includes hand-drawn receipts that tally up the costs of her various medications and treatments for manic depression. And in Kid Gloves, Lucy Nisley asks the reader to bear witness to the absurdity of a sick person being sent home from hospital because they cannot afford to stay there. In this panel, there's a huge amount of negative space, which visually represents the gulf between the insurance company, only represented by the phone, and the provider relaying this message uh, from the sick patient and her family, who is literally backed into a corner. So, the individual's record, medical record, made public in the form of a graphic medical memoir, isn't only solipsistic. A lot of these memoirs include a specific address to other patients going through the same illness or similar struggles, struggles in the medical system. In these panels from Cancer Vixen, Akachella imagines all the other people diagnosed with cancer that has possibly also been caused by toxic environmental hazards. In asking readers to bear witness to their own personal experience, the cartoonists also ask the reader to bear witness to the experience of other patients and to broader dysfunctions of the medical system. Um, so I wanted to turn, in conclusion, um, outside the field of graphic medicine and the larger public discourse around health justice, specifically in the movement for a single payer or Medicare for all system, and how it uses personal testimony as a tool of this movement. Right now, personal testimony from medical providers on the front lines of the pandemic is circulating on social media, providing the public with the most direct and unfiltered realities of our current crisis. And for years, but especially over the last few months, um, on Twitter, but also in town halls all over the country, people have been sharing their personal tragedies and stories of their medical debt to expose the inhumanity of a for-profit healthcare system and hopefully build empathy and convince the public that a more just, accessible, and humane system is possible. Um, so I wanted to end this section of our talk with this question, because if patient-made graphic narratives of illness and the graphic narratives made by everybody involved in graphic medicine are already functioning as a kind of testimony, what could the role of graphic medicine be in the movement for health justice and for Medicare for all, which is already using personal testimony as a vital tool? Um, so that is the end of my talk. We're gonna segue over to Natalie. For just a moment, let's let Izzy have her own round of applause or emojis or icons or whatever we do <laughs> to signify appreciation. Uh, and we will, of course, do the same uh, for Natalie. So I'm sorry to interrupt the flow, but I did want to uh, also activate uh, Natalie's microphone, uh, turn down Izzy's microphone. There we go. Clap, clap, clap. <laughs> yes, it, it's sincere though. These are these are sincere clap, clap, claps. 
So thank you very much, Izzy. Uh, Natalie, please proceed. All right, thank you. Uh, my presentation, Trauma Narratives, Putting the Graphic in Graphic Memoir. Uh, the text in the panels reads, you violated me and then you died. Now, I wanna start with a brief uh, content warning for um, there'll be mentions of sexual violence and one image depicting violence. I will provide a specific warning before showing this image. So I'm a cartoonist, comics librarian, and soon to be graduate from the Center for Cartoon Studies. I work ex uh, exclusively in memoir, and I'm working on my first book, Dear Minnie, which explores my personal experiences with sexual assault and abuse, post-traumatic stress disorder, and resiliency. I was first diagnosed with complex PTSD in my early teens. By my late teens, I began reading just about anything I could get my hands on about PTSD and trauma in order to make sense of my own experiences and figure out how to escape this post-traumatic apocalypse. This presentation includes both a research component and knowledge gained via first-hand experience. As a side note, all images that are not captioned with the citation are my own. So during this presentation, I'm gonna be moving back and forth between trauma and comics before I uh, examine their intersections. The questions I will be posing are, what is trauma? What are comics? How does trauma impact the different hemispheres of the brain? How can comics bridge the left and right brain? Healing, what does it really mean? Can comics help us heal? Why are we compelled to tell these stories? What are the risks of trauma representation? How do we know when we are ready? So trauma is notoriously difficult to define given its subjective nature. My own definition includes any event that shatters our perception of our place in the world. The DSM-5 definition of trauma requires actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violence. Now this is a significant shift from the more expansive definition in the DSM-4 most notably in now denying that psychological stressors can qualify as traumatic. One positive change, however, reflected in the new DSM is that PTSD is now part of a diagnostic category, trauma and stressor-related disorders, and no longer classified as an anxiety disorder. I've always found the categorization of PTSD as an anxiety disorder to fundamentally misunderstand the experience of trauma. Anxiety can be a symptom, but is in no way the overarching experience. Trauma happens on a spectrum, both in terms of the intensity of the event, as well as the level an individual will become traumatized. There is no consistent correlation between the two. What may severely traumatize one person may leave another only temporarily rattled. It should be noted that when we speak of trauma, this is not interchangeable with PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder and complex PTSD are mental health disorders. Not everyone who is traumatized will develop PTSD. PTSD is generally related to a single event, while complex PTSD is related to a series of events or one prolonged event. The symptoms of complex PTSD can be more enduring and extreme than those of PTSD. For the purpose of my own research and this presentation, I have established three categories that are foundational to most trauma. Dissociation. The fragmentation both of self and memory occurs on a spectrum and includes derealization and depersonalization. Alienation, or isolation from others and also the self. Immobilization. This can be physical or psychological. It's typically the result of moving through fight or flight and collapsing into a freeze response. For people with PTSD, this experience of being stuck in space during the trauma manifests as being stuck in time in the months or years to come. Art Spiegelman has a great quote that comes from this panel. Time, he sighed, comics are time, time turned into space. Space and time are key players in comics and in differentiating the roles of the left and right brain hemispheres. So I have a feeling that everyone here probably knows what comics are. You're also probably aware that similarly to trauma, they're notoriously difficult to define and are referred to under many names, which I've included on this slide. 
The most succinct way I could think to describe them are words and images working symbiotically to convey a narrative. Although there are comics that don't use any words, sometimes referred to as silent comics. The effect of trauma on the brain is often discussed in terms of the relationship between the triune or three-part brain comprised of the brain stem, limbic system, and neocortex. But I would like to shift the focus to the two hemispheres of the brain, which are located in the cerebrum. To the left, we have language, logic, time, and sequence. And on the right, there are visual, emotions, intuitive, and spatial. Trauma on the two sides of the brain. At its most extreme, trauma takes away our words and leaves us only with images. During a flashback, only the right side of the brain is activated. This has been seen via MRIs of patients having a flashback. More specifically, Broca area, a speech center located in the left brain, goes totally offline, while Broadman's area 19, part of the visual cortex which registers images as they first enter the brain and is located in the right brain, comes online. Now, the fact that Broadman's area 19 is activated means that your brain is experiencing the visuals of a memory as if it is currently seeing them in reality. Normally, raw images are only registered here temporarily before being diffused to other areas of the brain. The panel to the right from my, a draft of my graphic memoir depicts the first time I had a full-blown flashback and reads, I could not speak, I could barely move, and through the terror came a moment of clarity. A subset of therapeutic modalities called bilateral stimulation, which engage both hemispheres, are often used to help process trauma. There are three forms of bilateral stimulation, and they are EMDR, which uses eye movement, tapping, which involves physically tapping on both sides of the body, and brain spotting, which utilizes sound, but should also be noted that there are other aspects that make brain spotting slightly different. When I started looking into how comics are processed in the brain, I was stuck by the similarities that seem to exist between these bilateral stimulation modalities. Bilateral stimulation allows patients to access traumatic memories without becoming re-traumatized. It is not a form of exposure therapy that desensitizes the patient to a memory or trigger. Instead, for reasons that are still not fully understood, it is able to help integrate the fragmented experience of trauma. These modalities harness the mind's ability to heal itself. This chart from the new drawing on the right side of the brain illustrates how there is almost equal engagement with both hemispheres when it comes to comics. I've marked the categories in red that are most commonly used in comics, although I think an argument could be made for all of the categories, especially in more experimental comics. One could say our two brains speak different languages, and comics can be the translator. It should be noted that drawing and reading comics, although it does engage both sides of the brain, it's not exactly the same as therapeutic bilateral stimulation, since it doesn't involve the rhythmic alternating between hemispheres. But I think that the similarities are striking and could explain some of the unique, powerful, and inexplicable ways in which comics impact both their creator and audience. Here I want to take a moment to examine the impact of different drawing styles in how the brain processes these images and the reader's emotional experience. As noted on the previous chart slide, icons or symbols, although they are images, are actually read by the left brain. These are two pages from two very different comics I've done. The first is drawn in the style of Ed Emberley, entirely relying on icons. The second from my comic Mermaid Parade. Individually, icons, like pictographs, are read by the left brain, although their spatial relationship, like in this story, will be synthesized by the right brain. In comparison, the more naturalistic drawings from Mermaid Parade are read entirely on the right side of the brain. Comics are often considered a medium reliant on simplification, but the degree to which you simplify images changes the emotional impact. Scott McCloud claims that the stick figure is the most universal image of a human, and therefore the reader will identify more with them. 
In memoir, a simplified style can serve to tell certain stories, especially ones where the protagonist speaks to larger cultural and so social issues, like in Marjane Satrapi's Persepolis, documenting her experiences during and after the Islamic Revolution. The page on the right from Una's anonymous account of sexual assault focuses heavily on the cultural landscape of misogyny and seeks to unite all women who have been victims of gender-based violence. But in other memoirs, there is just as much power in the specific. Phoebe Gleckner and Alison Bechdel are two examples where heavily rendered art creates a vivid and in turn devastating intimacy. When telling an account of interpersonal and family trauma, these authors are giving us a glimpse into their subjective reality. We identify with aspects of the characters, but the story's strength lies in our love of these characters as individuals. When we talk about trauma in the medical field, the focus inevitably turns to healing. But what does this really mean? In Leela Corman's comic, The Wound That Never Heals, she says, and flashbacks, the star of the show in the popular imagination. You have to make them stop, but that is just triage. You do that to stop the bleeding. The wound never heals. Some of you may be familiar with the term top-down versus bottom-up in approaches to trauma therapy. Bottom-up meaning starting from your body and working your way through the brain from the brainstem to the neocortex, frontal lobes, and prefrontal lobes. This category includes bilateral stimulation and other somatic therapies. In reverse, top-down takes a more cerebral approach, like traditional talk therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and dialectical behavioral therapy, in the hopes that psychological awareness will diminish physiological symptoms. It is becoming more widely acknowledged that top-down modalities do very little to help process trauma. Trauma is, trauma is too all-encompassing, stored in the deepest parts of the brain and in the body itself. So what exactly marks the point in which trauma is processed? Does healing occur when the memories have been fully integrated? When physiological responses to triggers are neutralized? When you are able to self-soothe or remain present? Or is it when you are able to mourn the loss of the self you once were and piece a new, more resilient self back together from the traumatic fragmentation. Returning to the three tenets of trauma that I spoke about at the beginning of the lecture, I want to examine how comics can serve as a healing modality. Combating dissociation is an interesting one because drawing yourself is both a form of embodiment as well as the embodiment of dissociation. You are literally outside yourself. Here, Leela Corman depicts her experience of dissociation, describing it as two movies playing at once. Sharing our stories can be an anecdote to alienation. When we are able to forge connections with other survivors and experience being seen and accepted with our most vulnerable parts exposed. The only way to counteract immobilization is to move. And I believe that creative expression can be a powerful way to become unstuck. I spoke at the beginning about immobilization manifesting in survivors as being stuck in time. And I think the act of reimagining that moment of time and then witnessing the character version of yourself move out of that moment can be immensely therapeutic. Over the next few slides, I will be discussing the idea that drawing can help us access information and emotional experiences stored in the body and how this manifests through what is clinically called switching. Cartoonist and professional medical illustrator Phoebe Gleckner is an exceptionally skilled draftsman, which we can see from these highly rendered panels. Now compare this page to the following panels that take place on the previous page of the same story. I'd like to give a warning, the next slide contains some violent imagery. Cartoonist and professional, oh, as the intensity escalates, her drawing style radically shifts. The characters are no longer photorealistic. Instead, they seem to embody the psychological reality of that moment. During my process of writing the first draft of my graphic memoir, I've often found myself taken aback by what feels like the sudden shift in my drawing ability. It is as if whatever channel that communicates to my drawing hand becomes filled with static. 
What I have come to realize is that these shifts correspond to moments of emotional distress. It seems that the emotional experience alters the way I make marks on the page. The term switching is used to describe the phenomena when a patient's handwriting dramatically shifts when writing trauma narratives, typically becoming messier. It can also refer to shifts in voice when patients relay traumatic narratives aloud, sometimes dropping or elevating several octaves. It would be easy to see the faltering of my drawing hand as evidence of further brokenness caused by trauma, but instead, I see this as an important information being transmitted from the deepest parts of my brain and body onto the page. I think some people are drawn to tell these difficult and painful stories when they know how soul-crushing the other side can be, silence. Bessel van der Kolk says it perfectly. Silence reinforces the godforsaken isolation of trauma. The panel here says, words, where do you go when you fail me? One powerful aspect of graphic memoir is the relationship that is forged with the younger character version of yourself. It creates a dialogue um, between the current you, where you can offer insight and hindsight through narration while honoring the mindset of your younger self. Another driving force for some is the concept of alternate jurisdiction, a term coined by comic scholar Hilary Chuck. This idea posits graphic memoirs as a personal testimony in the public sphere when legal action is not possible or desired. It can be seen as a form of restorative justice when the survivor holds all of the agency. One thing that body-based healing modalities don't address is the immense weight of being the sole witness to something unbearable, how holding these images in our minds and souls alone takes its toll, and how some people have a need to share. Graphic memoirs are a chance to exercise these images, expelling them. But what happens when others are not prepared or willing to face on the page what you have faced in reality? The page to the right speaks about my experience of having some of my early work be met with immense discomfort by the audience. It reads, it was clear that I had crossed some unspoken line that I had never encountered when sharing vulnerable work and writing workshops or when presenting drawings on their own. I see now that this speaks to the power of combining words and pictures and personal testimony. The viewer is confronted with a fully depicted experience. There is no ambiguity to hide behind. They have entered your subjective reality. There's a reason trauma is considered taboo. Silence is not only caused by survivors being unable to speak, it is also a result of others being unwilling to listen. Bringing horrors to light destabilizes everyone's belief systems, and as a result, it can be easier for others to discredit or attempt to silence someone who threatens the status quo than to accept what a survivor has experienced. I can think of five memoirists, both cartoonists and prose authors, off the top of my head who have had major fallout with family, ranging from angry confrontations to being written out of wills and even sued. The mentality of don't air your dirty laundry can be extremely hard to overcome in certain families and communities. Libel is also a very real concern when telling stories that implicate someone in felonious or abusive behavior. When cartoonists discuss the ethics of autobio, there is often a focus on obscuring the identities of other people involved in order to protect those individuals. Changing names and altering appearances of the other characters in your comics can be just as important in protect protecting you from retaliatory behavior. Censorship is also a threat when a story contains graphic depictions of sex, drug use, and violence especially involving minors. In the case of Phoebe Gleckner, her collection of short stories, A Child's Life, was seized by customs officers and banned from entering France and Canada, as well as removed from some public libraries on the basis of it containing child pornography. And yet despite these risks and challenges, memoirs continue to persist. So how do you know when you are ready to tell a traumatic story? One of my favorite metaphors for doing work about trauma was developed by author and writing teacher Katie Standifer. 
If we take a look at our minds as a compost bin, we can see that the top at the top we have rot, but where we want to get is to the fertile soil at the bottom. When a traumatic incident occurs, it enters the compost bin and begins to rot. Trying to create a cohesive work for other people to comprehend is nearly impossible at this stage. We call these chaos narratives. So how do we metabolize the rot in order for the experience to become fertile? It's different for everyone, but some common methods are time, therapy, support groups, journaling, and I would like to suggest that comics can help in processing. Using the medium as a means of processing is something that often occurs in diary comics. It can be a great private experience that allows you to utilize the power of the medium to face the unfaceable without the pressure of an audience. There can be a lot of active learning during this stage, but it can also be immensely overwhelming, and in some instances, re-traumatizing. In my own comics, I've chosen to only publicly share experiences I have already processed to a certain degree. For me, memoir is about sharing the insights I have gained through experience. The point is not to show you how I have suffered, but how through suffering, wisdom is gained. Thank you so much for your time. I have several sources, uh, slides with sources. If anyone is interested, I can uh, send those along to you. And I'd like to end on our contact information. Thank you, Natalie. That was uh, terrific. It was revealing and brave and honest um, and quite beautifully analytical along with it and those things so rarely go together. So thank, thank you. you so much for doing that. We have had any number of requests across all of the panels, but inclusive of uh, yours and Izzy's, if these slides can be shared, um, certainly in the aftermath of the conference of the virtual summit, we have no problem with distributing it to the attendee list, but you could also uh, post to any social media channel that you are comfortable with. Uh, if you like. Uh, that sure. is entirely at your discretion. So let's just take one moment uh, before we shift up. I would like just to check if Karen is there, if Karen can test her camera for us, just a moment. If it is not in fact working at this time, I will work with her during Phoebe's uh, discussion. But uh, thank you for the Center for Cartoon Studies for allowing the two of you to be uh, with us today, and we will come back to you with the Q&A. Great. We all agree that was absolutely terrific, and especially nice to hear from um, artists' perspectives. Uh, Karen, are you able to activate your camera at this time? Excuse us just one minute. Please feel free to continue chatting it up. Uh, I may, uh, bow tie, I may um, take the moderator's privilege and have us extend to 2.30. Um, so if that conflicts with anyone's schedules, we understand this is being recorded. Okay, Karen is attempting to connect her video now. Give us just one more moment, if you all would. I think a lot of great resources were shared, both here and over, if you missed them in the chat. Okay, I think we have I think we have Phoebe back in audio, yeah, I not can't. yet video. Seen Karen's video yet, but I believe you're still attempting to connect. Yeah, my camera icon disappeared, and I'm not sure where it went. Um, okay. Well, in that case, I would say just re-enter the room. Okay. I'm sure you have the link still, but exiting the room and uh, uh, causing it to reactivate the camera is probably best. Let me see if. I, I have not blocked your camera, so you should be able to connect now.
Ah, we do have the slides here for Karen. That's excellent. Karen, are you able to briefly greet the audience? Many slides. Ooh, now it's getting trippy. So we're at the beginning of Karen's presentation, but I'm hoping that Karen can greet us by camera for a moment, as well as activate her microphone. I'll just reiterate uh, something that was said earlier. All of these uh, will be available as recording after the fact. Um, uh, there's Phoebe. We will. Uh, I'm going to remove briefly Karen's presentation. And Phoebe, did you have slides you wanted to activate? Um, yeah, I'm still figuring out how to uh, how to bring them up on screen. But I'll just start right now. Uh, my presentation um, is uh, talking about the uh, the intersection of epilepsy and law enforcement, um, and I've had I'm, I don't I'm not a someone who has a, a epilepsy myself, but I've been a paramedic for several years now, and I've uh, been public. I'm also a graphic novelist. I've been published by the Ameri uh, American Medical Association Journal of Ethics, and um, I've also essentially had some experience in watching what it's like for a patient who has a seizure disorder have a negative interaction with law enforcement. And uh, this is sort of, I will, I will, I understand this is sort of a pre COVID 19 problem, but once, uh, you know, whether it be a few months or a year, we're going to go back to how society was earlier. And these problems of essentially how do we help people with seizure disorders or people who due to medical disorders like diabetes or some mental health disorders um, have a medical crisis. And when law enforcement gets involved, a lot of times they're more vulnerable to being arrested or more vulnerable even to being very hurt or even shot, especially in the United States, because um, police officers or even the public at large don't understand that there's a difference between somebody having a medical problem and somebody behaving in a criminal manner. And I often believe that using graphic medicine would be a great way to help the society at large understand, listen, this person who is acting oddly in public may not be a criminal. This person could very well be having a medical problem. Before you start calling the police, please be advised you may actually be uh, uh, interacting with somebody who is who actually needs medical attention, not law enforcement attention. So um, I did pull up a couple of slides here about what seizures are like. Essentially, it's, this is this is very sort of anatomy and physiology 101 for the medical professionals here in this discussion. But for graphic medicine creators who are coming from another perspective, uh, this uh, this is just a quick rundown. Um, so obviously during a generalized seizure it involves a sort of electric storm in the brain. And there are many different types of seizures. Um, there's sort of the tonic clonic seizure, which people who are not healthcare workers sort of identify as all seizures, the sort of the collapsing, the shaking on the ground. Most people see this as a seizure. What they don't understand is that there are other types of seizures as well, like a partial seizure or um, a, fo a focal seizure where a person is not collapsing on the ground, they're not shaking, they're standing, they're breathing, but they're acting in a way that could be mistaken as criminal behavior. They have automatisms like fiddling with the clothes or smacking their lips. They have a sort of a flat, glassy expression. 
Uh, they don't really know what's happening, but they will wander off. They will go around. They will say if they're in a reception area, they may go around to the receptionist's computer, will start fiddling with it. And if you interact with somebody while they're having that type of seizure, um, that person may react suddenly like this. That person may react even in a violent manner because they don't know what's going on. And more importantly and more dangerously, they can't follow directions. So if a receptionist seeing somebody like this or the public at large sees someone like this and calls law enforcement and law enforcement comes and says, sir, put your hands in the air, sir, sir. And the person does not obey directions because they're having a seizure. That person may end up being hurt, possibly in best case scenario, arrested or worst case scenario, something more hideous like being shot. Um, I'm going to go on to the next slide now real quick discussing this. Um, so, uh, all right, so as this slide, this is just some, rest, uh, some statistics about epilepsy. This is, um, it's, very, uh, it's, it's more common than people believe. Millions of Americans have it. Um, and, and there are just many, uh, different problems that go along with somebody who has epilepsy. Um, roughly 200,000 new cases of seizures and epilepsy occur each year. Around 60% of these seizures are tonic-clonic, so if the public at large sees this... Sees this? Okay, one second. One second. Um, if they, they can recognize a tonic-clonic seizure as a medical problem but they can't really understand, say, a partial seizure, as they can't really differentiate a partial seizure, uh, and they can't really differentiate between somebody having a partial seizure and somebody who may be behaving in a criminal way. And um, as I said before, I think graphic medicine would be uh, a great way, a great vehicle to help spread to the public at large information about seizures, uh, information about seizures that don't manifest in a, uh, stereotypical way, the way people consider them, but are ways in which can uh, help people understand that people suffering a partial seizure are not criminals. They're just people having a partial seizure and they require medical attention. All right. All right, I hope you can see that clearly. So um, in my uh, cartoons, I often try to talk about the intersection between peop, uh, between law enforcement and emergency medicine, um, and uh, people who are suffering from seizures. This is um, this is absolutely this is a reality mm -hmm. that they live in many ways, shapes, and forms. Now, the dialogue in this cartoon here is from uh, the reporter Kurt Eichenwald, and you may recognize him. You may recognize his name as a reporter who suffered a seizure when um, an anti-Semitic troll on Twitter. Uh, sent him a strobe gif, and because his seizures are sensitive to flashing lights, he suffered a seizure, and consequently pressed charges against the Twitter user who sent that strobe gif. Um, so it was it was a, a, a lawsuit that provoked a lot of questions about the First Amendment. It was a lawsuit that they talked about how Twitter could actually be used as a weapon. Um, however, Kurt Eichenwald has published many other articles concerning epilepsy, concerning his own experiences with epilepsy, concerning other people's own experiences with epilepsy um, that are a little more unrelated to what happened with Twitter. Um, he has talked about how he himself has been arrested while he was in a suffering, a post-ictal state after suffering a seizure. Now, obviously, um, so for those who don't know, when you are having a tonic-clonic seizure, that's the type of seizure where you fall down and, and shake, um, which most people recognize as a seizure, you don't breathe or you breathe sporadically. So when you come out of that seizure, you're no longer shaking, but your brain is still starved of oxygen and you could have after effects for a long time, for minutes to hours, sometimes even days. But people who are post-ictal, people who don't have a lot of oxygen in their brain, will act erratically, will be scared, will be frightened. If you try to interact with them, they will sometimes react violently. And consequently, a lot of times these people will have law enforcement called on them. And while many police officers are trained in first aid and CPR, if they see someone acting erratically, who is not responding to their directions, that person may very well be um, end up in custody. Um, so uh, Kurt Eichenwald at an event said he was discussing this and he encountered several other people, several other patients 
who had had this happen to them, who had been arrested while postdictal, who had been arrested while having a seizure. Um, so I translated some of his article into this graphic novel, um, uh, this page right here, where he described, he said, I, Kurt Eichenwald, uh, recently met a man with epilepsy who told me of the traumatic experience he faced while he was arrested post-seizure, this is during that oxygen star state, by police officers who believed he was drunk. And while in prison, they deprived him of his anticonvulsants, which he needed to not die, essentially. He needed so he wouldn't, you know, continue seizing and seizing and seizing until he passed on. Um, and it was really only after he, after he convinced a jailer, uh, one of the um, security guards at the, at, the, uh, at the incarceration center, that he needed that medication desperately, that he was able to take it. And then um, while at the event, Kurt Eichenwald uh, had another man approach him with a similar story saying, um, this man had experienced the seizure while during the seizure, he went through a plate glass window in front of a store. Police rushed over and began the process of arresting him until a loved one intervened, informing the officers that the man was not drunk, but epileptic. And um, Kurt Eichmann talks about how he himself experienced something very similar where he had a seizure, he was postdictal, he was acting erratically, he was no longer seizing, but he was acting erratically uh, due to oxygen starvation in his brain. He was arrested by law enforcement officers who believed he was drunk, they put him in the drunk tank, and his mother apparently found out what happened. She tried to tell the police officers that he needed to go to the hospital so he could have some anticonvulsant medication, so he could have some, you know, uh, essentially, so he, so he could uh, have some Versed or whatever medication, um, emergency medication he required to stop seizing. The police officers didn't listen. So she lived out of state. So she literally leapt on a plane, well, not literally left on a plane, but she literally drove to the airport, got on a plane, flew to the state where he was uh, where he was incarcerated and gave was able to give him the medication herself because she couldn't convince the police officers over the phone to do this um so uh, and obviously this isn't uh this this doesn't just apply to um people suffering from epilepsy it's also people who suffer from diabetes who may sometimes go into insulin shock or act erratically because their blood sugar drops and they can be mistaken for somebody acting in a criminal manner by law enforcement, and also by um, people who are uh, who who call nine one one, who say there's somebody acting here in a way that's frightening. We need police here too. Um, so I did call, uh, I did pull up this uh, this slide right here talking about the seizures, the partial seizures that can be confused with criminal behavior, um, like for example. The people, the difference between someone who's being a criminal and someone who's having a, a partial seizure, one thing to look for um, is like blank staring or even just sort of a flat or glassy eyed appearance. Um, lots of repetitive motion, which is called automatisms. People just start like fiddling with their clothes, fiddling with her hair, lip smacking like that, just demonstrating because I have the camera, um, and wandering about and not no. listening to directions and essentially also um, reacting like this in a very sudden manner, in a very frightened manner, if people try to interact with them. A lot of times it's, you have to sort of back off and wait for them, you know, to try to keep them from doing something dangerous like wandering into the street, but um, try not to engage with them because in many ways they're having a seizure at the moment and they could react in a, in a sudden or, 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 or a frightened manner. Um, going on to the next slide here. Phoebe, we are enjoying this great. It's both informative, but also very touching. The police uh, car. Yeah, yeah, we're talking about the police. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, and so this is just something else about um, what's going on with, with seizure types. And I did also want to talk about how I didn't really want this um, uh, this whole uh, talking about spreading awareness of, see of what happens with seizure, uh, <laughs> seizure activity um, to be a sort of a demonization of law enforcement. They are trying to do their jobs. We are not trying to do that. This is more a, a call to help people. Hopefully. Um, yeah before they call the police to understand, wait a second, this person is not a criminal. This person is uh, having a medical problem. This is just a simple rundown of 
uh, partial seizures, generalized seizures, all of that. Um, and uh, here we go. Um, also, I just wanted to talk about my own experience when um, being dispatched out to a seizure patient while um, the paramedic and uh, having a little slide trouble here. Uh, so for example, um, we were, I was once dispatched out to a seizure patient who was a child. He was 16 years old, but he was very large. Physically, he was very large. He was very imposing. Mm. And um, people were unsure about how to treat him. Now, fortunately, when he did have a seizure, he was surrounded by family. He was not in public. And he did have a tonic clonic seizure. So it was it, it, people could clearly see he was having a seizure. But when we got there, his seizure had passed and he was post ictal and which meant his brain was starved of oxygen. He didn't know what was going on and he was fighting everybody. And he was a large man. He was, uh, well, no, he was a child. He was 16, but he looked like a large man. He was about the size of this gentleman here who's having a partial seizure in this picture. Um, he was, uh, his family literally had to hold him down when we got him, when we got there. We were able to get him on the stretcher, but we needed like two or three strong burly male EMTs to get him on that stretcher. Um, he was not a criminal. He was just post ictal. He was having a medical problem. We got the oxygen on him, and it was like during the time you could see him slowly starting to come to a bit. He stopped being aggressive, and he started saying, "Where's my mom? Where's my mom?" All of that. And by the time we got to the hospital, about ten to fifteen minutes later, you know, he was starting to cry. He realized he was sick. He realized something bad had happened. He said, "I want my mom." And of course, by that point, <laughs> by that point. It was very clear. He was not a criminal. He was just a kid who had just had a seizure and needed some medical uh, needed some medical attention. But in that 10 to 15 minute interval, he could have been confronted by a law enforcement officer who could have just seen a very large, strong young man who is fighting everybody within his reach. Um, I like this picture here. This is of a man who's having a partial seizure. You can see he's he's pretty tall. He's pretty large. He's, I think he's about six two. Um, you can see that he's not really responding to the police officer's uh, directions, but she's trying to protect him. She's trying to keep him from wandering into the street. They're, I think they're practicing very good uh, safety maneuvers here. She's not, um, but this is, um, this photo looks like it was taken in the UK. The officers appear to be doing their job very well here. However, um, in some other instances, officers may not do so who do not recognize that somebody is having a medical crisis here may react in, in a less uh, a less great manner. Um, so I also, and, and this by the way also goes for other people who are having things like a, a sort of a diabetic crisis or a mental health crisis where they need medical attention and not just, um, and, 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 and not, and not, um, and not the cuffs as it were. Uh, all right, going on from here. We're seeing a page. Are you seeing, we're seeing a page? Yeah, we're seeing a page of uh, black and white pencil art. Yeah, that's, um, that's my page, which also talks about um, how we can sort of a graphic medicine can help sort of ease interaction between patient and uh, healthcare provider and law enforcement officer. Um, mm -hmm. This is, yeah, this is from my comic that was published in AMA Joe, an American Medical Association Journal of Ethics, um, which discussed giving medical care to a woman who was incarcerated and who was going into labor. She was pregnant and law enforcement handcuffed her to the stretcher while we transported her to the hospital. And it was a situation where she, um, th this, uh, this is a, not really about epilepsy so far, but it's sort of adjacent to the top, topic I was discussing earlier, um, where she was incarcerated under the law, she was a criminal. However, because she was pregnant, um, the law enforcement officers weren't really uh, aware or, or couldn't really ask her things like, how many pregnancies have you had in the past? How long was your labor then? It turned out she had a really quick labor. And consequently, this labor, which was her third childbirth, um, was going to go even quicker 
but they waited when she said, I'm having contractions, I'm having contractions, they waited. And by the time we got there, she was almost pretty much ready to go. Um, she was ready to, that baby was ready to go. And we just went as fast as we could. But even before we left, the law enforcement officer insisted that we cuffed her to the stretcher, which really, uh, which was dangerous for her and was, was dangerous for, you know, the child that was, she was about to give birth to. And if I think if there was a little more, if through graphic medicine or through any other type of awareness campaign, if law enforcement said, listen, at this point, you have to sort of weigh more in favor of a patient's safety than law enforcement officer safety. And don't do things like say, like, like cuff a laboring woman to a stretcher. This would be um, a way to help mitigate a lot of those horror stories that we get where people who are in a medical crisis are mistaken for criminals or are treated like criminals and bad results happen. Um, so in this uh, in this cartoon that I put forth, well, it, was, it was a little graphic novelette. Um, we transported the patient over to the hospital. And at this point she was crowning. By the time I got there, she was crowning. That baby was coming up, but she was still handcuffed to the stretcher. We had to move her over to the bed so she could deliver. And she was still handcuffed. You cannot transfer a patient who is handcuffed. So we had to talk to the law enforcement officer and the doctor said, please uncuff her. We need to get her on a bed now. And the law enforcement officer, I remember he actually tried to argue, even though we could see the top of the baby's head starting to come out, the law enforcement officer still argued saying she's still in police custody. And we hacked the, I remember the doctor actually having to scream at the police officer before the police officer did uncuff her and we transferred her over. Um, and uh, go, and unfortunately that she did deliver safely. She was safe, the baby was safe. Um, and I don't know what happened then because at that point she was no longer my patient. She was a patient of the doctor caring for her. Um, but sort of examining that uneasy overlap between patient care, medical care and law enforcement is, uh, so, is, is a field where I believe that graphic medicine can absolutely help um and, and not just for law enforcement but also for people who may need to understand well like i said before many understand the difference between a medical crisis and a crisis involving somebody who's a criminal all right next slide well you're uh, slide let me just mention that we will be going past our planned two o'clock cutoff. We've extended it until two thirty, if that affects anyone's plans whatsoever. Sorry to take that moment. Too. No, that's all right. That's all right. I'm just uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, and um, by the way, I did also want to answer your question, or, or I don't know if it was your question or uh, somebody else's question, but I'm uh, I'm not unfortunately um, aware of David B's epileptic. Um, so I can't really say if I'm um, happy with his depictions. Like I said, and I, I really should, um, I really should make this clear. I do not personally suffer from epilepsy. So um, the uh, seeing epilepsy from a first person perspective or a first person narrative is not something I can really uh, pass, uh, really uh, talk about in any sort of knowledgeable way. I've only seen it from as an outsider, um, but I, yeah. Uh, but I, I do, I do realize that sometimes even medical professionals like EMTs um, are not quite aware of just how complex this medical problem is, um, or even just the general public at large have a very one-dimensional view of seizures and don't realize that the, uh, there, there are just so many aspects to a seizure that you do not see in movies, you do not see in videos, you do not see in the public sphere, but which are absolutely familiar to anybody who is epileptic or somebody who's a caretaker for somebody with epilepsy or somebody who has a family who has epilepsy, a family member who has epilepsy. Um, and these aspects really probably should be, uh, should be known by the public at large in a, in a better way, in a better space. Uh, oh, excuse me. All right. Um, so, go, uh, so going on from there, um, how, much, how much time do we have left? We do, we do have, uh, want to make time for Karen, so uh, I say we're in the five-minute zone. Five-minute zone? All right, cool. All righty. 
Well, um, in that way, and in that case, um, I will just go on to uh, say essentially uh, that uh, there there are many ways, there are many shapes in which um, in which people can uh, discuss how to help make awareness for epilepsy possible, either for people who are uh, aren't personally affected by this disease but want to know more about it or should know about, more about it, and that in that way as well, um, and. Um, I actually, when I was preparing for this presentation, when I did look for uh, depictions of epilepsy in other graphic novels, it could be even anything from superhero novels to more personal narrative graphic novels to uh, even to children's no uh, graphic novels. Um, I was surprised at how little information there was. Um, I literally found more information about uh, spirit possession or uh, mm. or channeling mediums than I found anything about epilepsy. And what I did find were uh, either some tasteless jokes um, or depictions of epilepsy that were the tonic clonic seizure kind, that were the collapse on the ground and shake kind. And even as someone, as a medical professional myself, even I was surprised when I first saw videotape of someone having a partial seizure. Um, Cause I realized even then I thought, oh, that, that woman is having a seizure, but you would never know it. Cause she's standing up, she is breathing. You know, she looks glassy eyed, but and she's sort of fiddling with her hair and fiddling, fiddling with her clothes, which is something I do anyway. You know, which many people do anyway when we're sort of daydreaming or we're checking our phone or we're a bit bored. So, and she's wandering about fiddling with her hair and the uh, the neuropathology teacher who was showing us this tape was saying, this woman is having a seizure. You may not think so, but she is. And he was pointing out the repetitive moment of her, you know, movement of her hands. And even in that videotape of this woman having a seizure, I saw her walk up to somebody else who's fortunately an epilepsy camp counselor. So he knew exactly what was going on, but she still touched him and started fiddling with his clothes and fiddling with him. And he let her do that. Um, because he knew she was having a seizure. But imagine if that's somebody on the street. What if that happens if somebody on the street, what if she went up to a police officer and started touching him like that, you know? And these seizures can last three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, which is um, which is an eternity when you're, you know, you know, trying to make the, the call as to whether this is a criminal matter or this is a medical matter. And, um, so in that case, I often believe in my own personal and my own personal uh, belief, my own personal graphic novels and my own personal ways in which I th I'm trying to sort of use graphic medicine to talk about emergency medicine, where you have to make spur of the moment decisions like this, um, that we can absolutely spread more awareness of seizures that people don't really know about or seizures that because they're slightly more rare, I think only 40% of epileptics, which is still a very large amount of people, uh, tend to suffer more partial seizures than tonic clonic seizures. Uh, nevertheless, there are people out there who have these seizures and these seizures are much harder for, you know, the, the man on the street to spot as a seizure and not as somebody is acting weird. He's walking into private areas. He's fiddling with computers he shouldn't fiddle with. We need to talk to, uh, to a police officer. And if this guy isn't following directions, that police officer will have the right to shoot him or something like that. Um, that's that's you know we essentially what Kurt Eichenwald was saying in his article say, um, titled "Epilepsy is Illegal." That he was talking about lives being saved because of more of this awareness, because not just from the police officer side, but also from the common public side, um, because police officers don't even arrive at a scene unless they're dispatched out. And they're dispatched out if somebody calls 911 and says, there is a hostile person here who's wandering into secure areas if he is not listening to our directions. You know, so please, uh, so people already have an idea of what's going on. So I'm hoping with either graphic medicine no uh, novels, uh, gra graphic medicine narratives, or with books, um, we can essentially help save some lives in this way. Maybe thank you. <laughs> for that talk um, and the circumstances that we're operating under we respect them and admire them so uh, oh, thank, thank you, you for that. Um, I'm thank going you so to much. mute you just for the moment we will return to you during the Q&A uh, but I believe we have uh, Karen Rohr now with us I'm going to bring up her slides I'm not 
certain that she is able to uh, be with us visually. But Karen, can you hear us and can we hear you? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, indeed we can. 